Hey guys, welcome back, or if you're new here, hi, welcome, I'm Georgia, and I make videos and podcasts about unsolved true crime, missing people, murdered people, unidentified people, trying to spread the word about these cases in the hope that one day we might be able to uncover some answers. What I do online can sometimes be quite heavy though, so occasionally I do like to focus on a lighter hearted mystery, cases which are less high stakes. And today is one of those days. Today I want to talk about the unexplained phenomenon of the Phoenix Lights, when in 1997, thousands of people across Phoenix, Arizona in the USA saw a series of mysterious lights in the sky. Some of those people even claimed seeing a large V-shaped craft pass directly over their heads, something which has always defied explanation. This remains one of the most infamous unexplained UFO sightings in modern history. But before we get into it, I want to take a moment to thank June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. June's Journey is a mobile game that I've played and loved for a very long time. It's a hidden object mystery game where you play detective and try and solve the murder mystery of June's sister. June's Journey is completely free to download and is available on Android and iOS mobile devices as well as on PC through Facebook games. You basically have to find clues in these hidden object scenes in order to take you further into the story, discovering new characters in the mystery, piecing together photographs, slowly step by step solving the mystery as to what happened to June's sister. As you progress through each chapter, the beautifully crafted 1920s style hidden object scenes become more complicated relying on your detective eye and your memory to find the objects, and hopefully unlock a clue. And all the while, you're also trying to renovate the old rundown mansion and island belonging to June's family to bring it back to its former glory. The more land you renovate, the faster you can progress through the chapters. I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone that I really enjoy the mystery aspect of this game. I love slowly unravelling the story and trying to figure out where it's going. My job can be pretty heavy at times, no surprise to anyone. So after work, I like to relax on the sofa with June's journey and just switch off for a little bit, let my brain reset and have a nice chilled evening ahead. You can download June's Journey by clicking on the link in the description box down below. Like I said, it is completely free to download and I know so many of you are going to really enjoy this. So make sure you go and give it a go. UFO stands for Unidentified Flying Object and whilst it's a word or an acronym that is often closely linked with aliens and undiscovered extraterrestrial life, it really just refers to any perceived aerial phenomenon that cannot be immediately identified or explained. Upon investigation, most UFOs will generally be identified as known objects or explainable atmospheric phenomena, but a small number of sightings do remain unexplained kind of forever. Some things never have any reasonable explanation. UFOs have been observed in the sky throughout human history with evidence and writings dating all the way back to Roman times. Of course, a lot of times throughout history, we can maybe assume the mysterious things people have written eyewitness accounts about are meteors or comets, maybe other planets. But again, some can't be easily explained away. On the night of March 13th, 1997, there were two very distinct UFO incidents that happened that night. Sightings reported between about 7.30pm, maybe 8pm and 10.30pm. And let's explore them today. Were they really unidentified flying objects? From statistics I took from a USA Today article dated Wednesday, June 18th, 1997, apparently the Phoenix incident came at a time when interest in UFOs bordered on this kind of national obsession. Movies, television, literature all centred around the idea of extraterrestrials, alien space. Think of the vampire obsession of the late noughties, that was kind of UFOs in the mid-90s. A poll from June 1997 by CNN and Time magazine found that 22% of adult Americans believe intelligent beings from other planets have been in contact with human beings. A Gallup poll from September 1996 found that 72% of Americans believe there is life on other planets and 71% said that they think the USA government knows more about UFOs than they're telling. 
people were not only fascinated by UFOs, but also believed that they were real. I say believed in past tense, people still believe now in present tense. I mean, I personally do believe there must be life on other planets in other galaxies. You've got to be pretty big-headed to believe that Earth is the only planet in the entire galaxy with sentient life, but maybe that's just me. Let me know in the comments if you believe in life on other planets or not. And I'm not talking about life as sort of parallel to humankind, I'm talking about life of any kind, whatever sort of life that may be. Although disputed amongst sources, one of the first reports that came in on the Thursday night in question came in at around 8.16pm. A retired police officer in Paulden, about 60 miles north of Phoenix, reported to the National UFO Reporting Centre in Seattle, Washington, saying there was a strange cluster of red lights heading south. Less than two minutes later, a call came in from Prescott, about 15 miles south of Paulden, reporting one red and four white lights in the sky. I can only assume that these lights didn't look like those of your standard plane or identifiable flying object, hence why people started calling the UFO reporting centre. This is actually probably one of the reasons as well why sources are a little bit iffy around the timings here. People weren't calling the police, the sort of official authorities to report these. They were calling the UFO reporting centre. And the fact that these people were calling the UFO reporting centre suggests that these people were much more aware of UFOs. They're aware that this reporting centre existed. I must say that if I saw strange lights in the sky that concerned me, I think I'd personally call the police and not a UFO centre. This was the first of two events that night, and it's very important to remember there were two distinct events. But what exactly was this thing that people reported as seeing? Lots of people said it was this kind of V-shaped formation of lights. Some said that the lights weren't connected, some said they saw a giant triangular craft joining them. The most common description is that of a V-shaped object that had seven lights three on top of each prong of the V and a seventh trailing light apart from the others. Sometimes the lights blinked, sometimes they didn't, depends on whoever was reporting it. Some reported the object as being in the shape of a 60 degrees carpenter square, so kind of like this shape, with lights in the sort of legs of the shape. Some thought there was at a very, very high altitude, whilst others reported that it flew almost directly over their heads. All witnesses, however, said the lights were going south, slowly disappearing from view. From eyewitness reports at this time, it seems the lights are travelling about 200 miles in 30 minutes. That's 400 miles per hour. This sounds super fast, and that's because it is fast, but it is worth bearing in mind that your standard commercial passenger jet flies at about 460 to 575 miles per hour when cruising at 36,000 feet, so it's still slower than your standard plane. However, conservative estimates describe this thing, whatever this thing was, as being three football fields long. Computer analysis of the recordings taken by just witnesses say that it was 6,000 feet long or more than a mile. All in all, the event lasted around 106 minutes, and what people often report as being the creepiest thing about this is the fact that it was silent. Nobody reported hearing a single noise. If this was planes or a plane, you'd expect to hear it. Sometimes the formation would sort of stop and hover over a certain area for a little bit before moving on. By the time it reached Phoenix, it'd slowed down entirely from the 400 miles per hour to just 30 miles per hour, slowly cruising over the city and again, just hovering in random spots. Pilots flying this region also noticed the lights, asking air traffic controllers to try and identify them, but they couldn't, no one could. Although the air traffic controllers could look outside and see the lights, nothing at all was showing up on their radars. Bill Graver, who was a pilot and controller for 12 years and had tower duty at Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport that night, said, I still don't know what to think and I have no idea what it was. Something military, I guess. Tim Lay was an eyewitness who was getting out of his car when he saw the lights and he ran inside and grabbed his wife so she could see as well. 
He described the site as astonishing and a little bit frightening. It was so big and strange, you couldn't actually see the object, he said. All you could see was the outline, as though something was blotting out the stars. He went on to describe the lights like a kind of gas, a distortion on the surface, and the light didn't spill out or shine. The lights were perfectly uniform with no variation from one to the other and they had no glow at all. However, according to an article by Tony Ortega, a man called Mitch Stanley from Scottsdale was also in his yard at this time, but he had a large telescope. He noticed the strange lights approaching from the northwest, and his telescope was a pretty powerful one from what I can tell. It gathers 1,500 times as much light as the human eye, and magnifies up to 60 times. This basically means that he was 60 times closer to the lights than people on the ground without a telescope. Mitch is pretty insistent that what he saw through his telescope was planes. He is sure that what he saw was each light split into pairs on the wings of small planes, or maybe big planes that were flying really, really high. He's always remained pretty insistent that that is what they were, but so many others are sure the lights were stranger than that, so many things about them unexplainable. And Mitch Stanley is just one of many, many witnesses. And this first lot of sightings wasn't even the strangest thing that happened that night. It seems like the media at the time, or in the weeks after, and in the years since, have spent a lot of time focusing on the second event instead of the first. Perhaps because the second event is just more well documented, after the strange goings on earlier in the evening, people were just now on high alert, watching the sky, ready with their cameras. Subsequently, the second event has been described as the most witnessed UFO event in history. So this second event is described as a row of brilliant lights hovering in the sky or slowly falling in the sky. Up to nine lights have been described. These lights appeared for several minutes southwest of Phoenix in the direction of the Sierra Estrella. And whilst all nine lights were visible from multiple locations, some miles and miles and miles away, others described seeing fewer lights. For weeks, this was huge. People across the city, across Arizona, were convinced that they'd seen alien activity from Earth. And considering the strangeness of the event, what else were they meant to think? For me though, the first event is the stranger one. Perfectly uniform, silent lights moving in unison, with no glow, nothing seemingly attaching them to the human eye. And this ended up going above the normal person. Like, this wasn't something that a normal person could sort of provide any answers to. Phoenix Councilwoman Frances Barwood was the first one to cry for an official probe into this event. And this was weeks after when it was still all anyone could talk about on May 6th. She went to a council meeting and asked the city manager, Frank Fairbanks, whether anybody was actually investigating into this. And it was after this point that the media really grabbed onto this story. Although it had kind of been lightly reported on in the newspapers before this point, now about six weeks after the event, it was finally becoming a real talking point in the papers. I'm sure some people could come up with conspiracies as to why it was initially brushed over for the most part, but still, it was eventually covered very extensively. Frances Barwood said that after she spoke publicly about this, a city official speaking publicly, calls started pouring into her home and her office from others who had also witnessed this event. From what I can gather, once a more high profile person started speaking about it, others came forward and it just kept snowballing. Frances said that there were 37 calls from members of the public that day, and after that, it climbed into the hundreds, doctors, lawyers, celebrities, all telling their versions of the story. In response, Phoenix officials said they couldn't investigate. They had no air force and it was beyond their resources to chase lights in the sky. I mean, the city were in charge of picking up trash from the streets, not investigating possible alien activity. The spokesman for the mayor said that the governor was the person to call. 
The governor at this time was a man called Fife Symington, and his involvement in all this is honestly, is, is just bizarre. In those first few weeks, his office weren't involved in anything to do with it. But when a caller to his regular weekly radio programme called in to ask about it, Simon said this was the first he'd heard of the lights, and therefore no official action was planned. And we'll circle back round to Symington in just a moment, but I've got some other things to say first. So with the governor refusing to do anything about this, Francis Barwood instead writes to US Senator John McCain and he referred the matter to the US Air Force in Washington DC. By the middle of June though, they closed the case already, announcing there was nothing they could do about these weird lights. That's because the US government hasn't been officially involved with anything UFO since 1969, when the Air Force shut down their Project Blue Book, which is the UFO investigative service created after the Roswell incident. The Air Force simply said that this was a matter of local jurisdiction, and so it all goes round in circles, with no one taking the bark for investigation, if there even really needed to be one. Was it something that needed official investigation? Well, no one was hurt, nothing happened, it was just very strange and people had a lot of questions that they wanted answering. The fact that it was getting ignored and brushed off by officials only led to more conspiracy theories, more speculation. Did the government know something that they weren't saying? And so it was left up to private organisations to investigate this instead, with the Mutual UFO Network, a band of 5,000 investigators from around the whole country, officially proclaiming this object was a UFO. Again, I want to stress that UFO does not equal alien, even though that's the leap that probably most of us make in our heads. UFO is simply an unidentified flying object and only about 5% of sightings actually earned that distinction at this time from this group. They were very hard to please, sightings were almost always explainable, but this one, it just wasn't. As State Director Tom Taylor said, I can't vouch for it being extraterrestrial, it could be military related, although I find it difficult to believe the military would let it fly around like that. But if this was military, military planes or military anything else, what would they do? I'm kind of in two minds about this. I mean, would the military admit that it was them doing this strange flight, or whatever it was, to avoid the public hysteria over UFOs? Or is it in their best interest to ignore it and just hope the hysteria passes? Now, as I said I would do, circling back round to the Arizona governor at this time, Fife Symington. He had a very strange part in this whole narrative, and he was actually a former Air Force captain. In 1997, he actually ended up holding a fake news conference, announcing that his Department of Public Safety had arrested the culprit responsible for the lights. And then he brought out an aide dressed as an alien, and then took off his head. And for those of you watching this on my YouTube channel, you will see that this aide looks suspiciously like Piers Morgan. It wasn't, but it kind of looks like him. But essentially, Symington was poking fun at all the people who believed that lights were indeed alien activity. He said that he wanted to lessen the sense of panic at the time, but in doing so, he just upset many of his constituents who felt like they were being ridiculed. He said, It goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. But I suppose to give him the benefit of the doubt, Symington was going through a lot at this time. This press conference actually came at the same time that he was appearing in federal court on a number of fraud charges, eventually being convicted of bank and wire fraud. That September he had to vacate his office, but the conviction was later overturned and he was given a full pardon by President Bill Clinton. Symington has said that he didn't need additional problems at the time, caused by admitting publicly that he'd seen a UFO, and for some reason he thought it was better just to poke fun at the whole thing. But years later, around 2007, so a decade after the event, he did a complete 180, admitted that he had indeed seen the lights that night. The only person he told at the time was his wife. According to an article on Tucson.com, he said, I'm a pilot and I know just about every machine that flies. It was bigger than anything that I've ever seen. It remains a great mystery. Other people saw it, responsible people. I don't know why people would ridicule it. Which is weird, as he was the one to ridicule it. 
He said that he kept quiet at the time about his encounter with the lights because he didn't want to panic his constituents, telling CNN that what he saw that night was enormous, it just felt otherworldly in your gut, you could tell that it was otherworldly. He's also said that he's always believed that life existed elsewhere, it's conceited to think that we're alone. On that point, I do actually agree with him. Politicians are always going to be politicianing, clearly. Which, I suppose, brings us on nicely to some theories in this case, because of course, most people do not believe that this was really alien activity. Most believe that it was actually some kind of military activity, which is nowhere near as fun, but just as secretive. I already spoke earlier in the episode about Mitch Stanley, the guy who saw the first set of lights, the V formation, through his telescope, and he said very clearly that he saw planes. And he wasn't the only one. Tucson astronomer and retired Air Force pilot James McGaha said that he's investigated the sightings and he's traced them both to A-10 aircrafts flying information at very high altitude. He also said that he spoke to another amateur astronomer who observed the A-10s as well and that he spoke to the National Guard unit that flew them. He said to Tucson.com, it was clearly aircraft information flying at two different times and then dropping flares and it's clear to any rational person that's what it was. In June, KPNX TV Channel 12 reporter Blair Meeks filmed a drop of flares by military planes over the Air Force gunnery ranges southwest of Phoenix. It's said that these lights that were caught on camera looked very, very similar to the second event on March 18th. Within just days of this, Tucson Weekly reported that the Maryland Air National Guard, who were in Arizona for their winter training, did indeed have a squad of A-10 fighter planes over the area that night and that they were responsible for dropping flares. It has been established that said flares have been dropped at 10pm 30 miles southwest of Phoenix at an unusually high altitude of 15,000 feet as part of Operation Skybird. Sources are conflicting though as to whether the National Guard actually admitted to this or research just showed this, but I think it is pretty much confirmed that this is an explanation for the second incident. It was military flares. However, in 1998, Captain Drew Sullen, spokesman for the Maryland National Guard, said that the A-10s, which do indeed have square wings as noted by Mitch Stanley, never went north of Phoenix. So by that logic, they could not have been responsible for the V formation of planes seen earlier in the evening. If you were a real conspiracy theorist, you could say that the military might have dropped the flares later that night to distract from the first event or to provide a viable explanation when they knew there wasn't one. Could also be why the media focused more on the second event instead of the first one. But what do I know? That is just a conspiracy theory. I really wanted to do the map pat, but that's just a theory, a food theory thing there, but I didn't. But I suppose I did because I just said out loud that I wanted to do that. <laughs> so originally in the immediate aftermath of this happening, the Air Force Base denied having any planes in the air at all that night. So that makes you wonder why they'd lie and then later it'd be confirmed that they were in the air dropping military flares. Then Lieutenant Colonel Mike Hauser said in a June 1997 article that there were fighter jets in the air at this time, but they had nothing to do with the lights in the sky. The jets were simply on a routine training mission. So again, now they're saying there were planes up there, but they weren't anything to do with the lights. Statements about this were all over the place. All of the sources I was using for this video were very confused and therefore I am very confused. But it does seem that it was never disclosed who was flying the planes at 8.30 p.m if they were indeed planes. Apparently radar operators have said that a formation of five planes traveling at high altitude around this area, so above Skies Harbor and outside of Luke Air Force's restricted airspaces, would not have been considered unusual. But there's nothing confirming that actually happened that night. The Federal Aviation Administration apparently deleted their radar information every two weeks and seeing as this didn't really pick up steam for many weeks after it happened, nobody requested this information in that time so therefore we might never know exactly what was in the air at this point. It's like whiplash isn't it, all these different sources saying all these different things but hey I've got more for you, it doesn't end here. 
According to Robert Schaefer for SkepticalInquirer.org in 2016, he says that five A-10 jets were indeed returning from an Air Force base near Las Vegas at this time. They were flying under visual flight rules, so they didn't need to check in with airports en route. Because they were flying in formation mode, they didn't have on their blinking collision lights, which might be more recognised as plane lights, but instead they had on their formation lights, which maybe most people wouldn't think were plane lights. Because they weren't required to check in with airports, maybe that could explain why air traffic controllers were saying there just wasn't anything on their notes, on the radars. I don't really know how it works, I'm not going to lie to you. And as I've said, other sources have said there were absolutely no jets in this area at the time. Others have said that there were, but they weren't responsible for the lights. There were no lights, no planes that went north of Phoenix. There is no straight answer here, hence why I'm making a video on it. An Arizona Republic article from the time, so in 1997, reads, Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson had its last plane out of the sky at 5.50pm that night, Lieutenant Colonel Keith Shepard said. The National Guard spokeswoman, Captain Eileen Ben, said that it might have been Air Force cargo heading to California. She said that military planes are usually the culprits when pilots or the public report strange lights. But Lieutenant Colonel Mike Hauser of Luke said that it's very unlikely the Air Force would send planes over the city at night. Considering the hysteria across Phoenix at the time about these strange lights in the sky, it would have saved a lot of confusion and questioning if the Air Force had just come out and been like, yeah, that was us, our bad, it was our planes. But they didn't, hence the fact we're still talking about it now in 2023. Why all the secrecy? Well, some people think that it could have been an experimental aircraft. It is well known that the US military and various aerospace companies conduct secret tests of new aircraft and propulsion systems from time to time. These things do have to be tested. What if the lights that night were something being tested, a new style of aircraft? It could explain why everyone was being so secretive about it all. Maybe they were testing their new V-shaped aircraft. However, you would probably think that if you were testing such a thing, you'd do it in a much more remote location though, not where people are clearly going to see it. Phoenix is also a very highly populated area and it seems a bit risky to test out a new aircraft with lots of people down below that could be hurt if something were to go wrong. So do I think it was an experimental aircraft? Probably not. The lights seen on March 13th didn't appear to be moving like any known aircraft, experimental or otherwise, and nothing similar has ever been seen again. If they were testing out a new aircraft, it never publicly came to light. So some look at the weather as a possible explanation, turning to ball lightning for an answer, and I had never heard of ball lightning before this video, and let me tell you, it is fascinating. So ball lightning is a rare and unexplained phenomenon described as luminescent spherical shaped objects that vary from pea size to several meters in diameter. It tends to hover over the ground and last for a few seconds to a few minutes, with the larger balls tending to last longer. There are multiple descriptions of ball lightning throughout history. This is a confirmed phenomenon that actually happens. I mean, just in June last year, there was a report of it in Austria. Descriptions of it vary. Some say that these sort of spherical balls move up and down, some sideways, some hover and move with or against the wind. They can be attracted to or repelled by buildings, by people, cars, just anything. Some reports show ball lightning moving through solid wood or metal without affecting them at all. Some say they melt them or burn them. Some say ball lightning is transparent or translucent. Some say it's multicolored or perfectly evenly lit. Sometimes they're perfect spheres, other times they're oval, sometimes rods, discs, they can be anything. They sometimes disappear suddenly, sometimes they disappear gradually, they just fade away. Sometimes they explode or they pop. This is not a one-size-fits-all situation, and I can totally see why some people would think that this would be a good explanation as per the Phoenix lights. Perfectly spherical bright lights in the sky with the light sort of being contained to the sphere. The only thing that stops me here is the number of them and the perfect V formation. Nature is cool, but I don't know if it's that cool. I don't know if it would just so happen that these spherical balls would just be moving in perfect unison, being perfectly uniform in a V shape. They're also usually associated with thunderstorms, and there just wasn't a thunderstorm that night. 
And I would say they're more of a viable explanation for the second set of lights that night, but they've already been pretty much written off as being military flares. Unless, of course, there's all some big cover-up and everyone's lying and they were indeed caused by extraterrestrial activity. We don't know. I'm not some big conspiracy theorist generally, but as I've said, I do believe it's very conceited to believe that humankind is the only life out there in the universe. I have no doubt there are life forms out there much more advanced than us, and they're out there somewhere. Do I think they bought their aircraft to float over Phoenix, Arizona in March 1997? That I'm not so convinced of. The sensible explanation here is that it was indeed military planes, and the reason they were so shifty about it in the early days, and I suppose even still now, is because it was military activity that they didn't want anyone to know about. They don't want to be spreading their movements out there for all to see. Maybe they were doing something they simply didn't want the public to know about, or other countries to know about. I don't know how military works. That's the sensible answer, isn't it? And you know what? I think that's still slightly more terrifying to me than the idea of alien activity. The fun answer is that it was indeed aliens, and I think that's what I'm going to tell myself it was, because why not? Still today, people who saw this with their own eyes refuse to believe that it was planes. They say it was unlike anything they've ever seen in their lives, and still they've never seen anything like it. While the extraterrestrial theory cannot be completely ruled out, there's no concrete evidence to support it. Furthermore, the idea that intelligent beings from another planet would visit Earth and then just simply hover over Phoenix, over a major city for several hours, seems highly unlikely. Surely they'd do something more fun whilst they were here, maybe. Or maybe they were just watching, observing, and their tech failed for a moment, and their invisibility cloak, whatever it was, just disappeared, allowing them to be seen. Who knows? A bit more of a silly, light-hearted video for you today, but I just, I needed it, you know, I needed it. Thank you so much, June's Journey, for sponsoring today's video. Make sure you go check them out in the top line of the description box down below. Thank you for tuning in today and spending this last half an hour with me, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, guys.